You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 265. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey veggie lover, welcome to another episode in the fasting series. Now this series is intended to provide education about the potential health and longevity benefits of different forms of fasting, including time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and extended water-only fasting. Please be aware that in this series, we will be discussing different forms of fasting and food restriction. And in some cases, there will be references to body size and weight. This material and these methods are not appropriate for children, pregnant people, or people with certain medical conditions. Please do not attempt these practices without medical supervision as it could be very dangerous. These concepts may also be triggering for people with disordered eating or eating disorders, so please practice discretion before listening to these episodes. Thank you and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Dr. Micah Yu is an integrative rheumatologist who incorporates complementary medicine with traditional rheumatology. He is triple board certified in rheumatology, internal medicine, and lifestyle medicine. He obtains his MD from Chicago Medical School and holds a master's in healthcare administration and biomedical sciences. He completed his internal medicine residency and rheumatology fellowship at Loma Linda University in Southern California. He has been accepted with a full scholarship to the Andrew Weil Integrative Medicine Fellowship at the University of Arizona. In addition, he has also taken courses in functional medicine through the Institute of Functional Medicine. Dr. Yu has a very unique perspective on autoimmune disease and arthritis, as he is both a patient with arthritis and a physician. Dr. Yu was diagnosed with gout at the age of 17 and later diagnosed with spondyloarthritis as well. The foundation of his practice is to com- combine allopathic medicine with complementary medicine. He works with patients to come up with a treatment plan that not only fights the disease, but also is aligned with his patient's goals. Dr. Yu has been featured in multiple articles and webinars, including Forbes Magazine, Sponsolo Arthritis Association of America, Lupus LA, and Creaky Joints. Takeaways from this episode in the fasting series, 50 million Americans have an autoimmune condition and 75% are women. Symptoms of autoimmune disease include memory problems, brain fog, joint pain and swelling, rashes, and a plethora of other symptoms. Diagnosing an autoimmune condition can take several months to several years. There are a variety of tools and methods that can be used to treat autoimmune disease, including lifestyle medicine, herbs and medications, and fasting. Fasting can be used a number of ways to treat symptoms of autoimmune disease. Please enjoy this episode in the fasting series right here on Veggie Doctor Radio. Dr. Micah Yu, welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. I'm so happy to have you back on the show. I'm so excited to be back. It's such an honor to be on your show, Dr. Yami, and I'm so excited to talk about autoimmune disease and fasting today. Yes, me too. I like really want to get into it. But before we get into all of that, let's start at the beginning again, just for people that may not know about you. I want them to know your story. So tell us about your story and why you are so passionate about treating autoimmune disease. Yeah, so my story, a lot of you probably know about the story already, but uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got into this field of rheumatology and autoimmune disease. So um, I got diagnosed with gout at the age of 17 when I went on a, what was back then it was called the Atkins diet, super high protein diet. 
Um, I got gout, which is not an autoimmune disease, but it is uh, arthritis, and it's a disease of uh, uric acid as well. And over the years, my disease actually transformed into something else. My arthritis started attacking different joints that I didn't expect it to. Um, so I got joint pain in my TMJs, my fingers, my wrists, my toes, everywhere. Any joint along the body, you name it, I got it. And um, I went to different rheumatologists during medical school. No one can explain why I was having these different pains. And my inflammation numbers were high. My autoimmune disease labs, the antibodies were negative at that time. And uh, it was just so frustrating because... I mean, I would take my gout medication. I would still flare. Um, but it wasn't until I got to uh, residency and fellowship that I finally got diagnosed with something called spondyloarthritis, which is an autoimmune disease of arthritis. So I have both spondyloarthritis and I have gout as well. And that got me really interested in rheumatology. But what got me into more integrative medicine, lifestyle medicine, uh, was the fact that I actually got fixed with a plant-based diet back in 2018. I went on a whole food plant based diet for a couple of months. Within three months, all my pain pretty much melted away. Um, so these days, I barely flare. If I flare, it's because I ate the wrong food. Um, and <laughs> foods I'm not supposed to be eating, too much processed food. Um, but that got really got me into um, this whole field of lifestyle medicine. And since the last time we've talked about two years ago, I've since finished my integrated medicine fellowship at the University of Arizona. And I've also got my functional medicine fellowship. I'm in functional medicine certification from the Institute of Functional Medicine as well. So I got a couple of things in my toolbox now that I can help my patients with on top of lifestyle medicine. I love it. I love it because I can tell how much you care. You devote all of this extra time to learning as much as you can so that you can help your patients with a lot of different modalities from a lot of different angles, very holistic, which when it comes to autoimmune disease, I think that's particularly important. But what is autoimmune disease? So give us some examples of common autoimmune disorders. You talked about spondyloarthritis, but maybe what are some others? And what is the prevalence of autoimmune conditions in the United States? Yeah, great questions. Um, so for going off your first question, um, autoimmune disease is pretty much a disease where your immune system is attacking its own cells. And autoimmune disease, yes, I'm a rheumatologist. I cover a lot of different autoimmune diseases of, especially joints and connective tissue. But autoimmune disease can range in different systems. So you can have, so my field, I cover lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or psoriatic arthritis, which some of them will be covering today. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, myositis, which is inflammation of the muscles to the point where patients can't uh, raise their shoulders, can't raise their, can't walk up the stairs. Then you can move on to neurology, where they cover multiple sclerosis, um, chronic demanding diseases, and then GI covers inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that's one example. And then you have type 1 diabetes, which is another autoimmune disease of endocrinology. You have hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, Graves' disease. Those are other autoimmune diseases as well. So as you can see, it covers a lot of different things, and it also can affect the skin as well. You have psoriasis. Um, you have um, pyoderma gangrenosum, some weird autoimmune disease out there can also um, affect the skin. So it can be very challenging diagnosing these diseases sometimes, especially if the symptoms don't aren't typical of what the doctor expects. And what do you, would you say is the prevalence in the United States? Like what percent of our population or how many millions of people are affected with autoimmune disease? Yeah, so um, I looked this up recently. There's about 50 million Americans with an autoimmune disease. 50 million. And 75% of those women, I mean, 75% of, of the 50 million are women, um, which is not surprising, especially coming from rheumatology. Most of our patients are women. Um, like lupus, for example, affects a woman 9 to 1 ratio compared to men. So 90% of lupus patients are women. Rheumatoid arthritis as well, more in women. Um, why is it more in women? It might be due to the hormones. Um, men and women, you know, women have more estrogen and that might be, uh, contributing to, um, the autoimmune diseases. So we don't have a clear cut answer right now. So I'm hoping that we have more answers in the future. Um, but yeah, 15 million Americans. And that's really crazy. That actually shocked me. I didn't expect that much because, you know, for rheumatoid arthritis, it attacks about 1 million Americans, <laughs> but 50 million is crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me because I don't watch TV very often. But when we do have the TV on, it's usually for my husband to watch football. You know, we'll we'll have the TV on for football. And almost all of the commercials are for drugs for autoimmune conditions. It's really astounding and eye-opening that this must be an issue when there's so much advertising aimed at these conditions. So can you go through a little bit of what are the kinds of symptoms that people might experience? Obviously, there's so many because it can attack any system in your entire body. But talk about some of the common symptoms that people start experiencing when they're having autoimmune disease or autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another great question. So with autoimmune disease, I mean, some of the common symptoms across all the different diseases that I've noticed, because I see patients beyond rheumatology in my clinic, um, brain fog, fatigue are common symptoms. Sometimes um, some patients will have some memory problems because of their brain fog as well. Um, those are some of the more common symptoms um, across all the systems. But if we're talking about like rheumatology, we see um, joint pain a lot, joint swelling. Um, we see rashes. A rash can be very hard to diagnose and you send them to dermatology. So you get psoriasis, you can have a lupus rash. You can have rashes from like ulcerative colitis. Um, you can also have what else? Dry eyes, dry mouth from Sjogren's. You can have um, skin thickening in disease called scleroderma where the wrinkles or your skin are actually removed. Like your skin is so thickened that you can't even pinch your skin. And that can be a devastating disease. Um, you can have, I'm just think like chronic low back pain that's undiagnosed. Like let's say you've had it since your twenties or your teens or your thirties and you've seen like five doctors, no one's giving you answers, you've gone to physical therapy, you've gone to a chiropractor, you've even seen an orthopedic surgeon, no one can explain why you have back pain. It's a possibility you might have ankylosing spondylitis and that's a recurring theme. Um, it takes a while for these patients to get diagnosed because no one's thinking about ankylosing spondylitis and the, this disease is pretty much eating away at the low back and sacroiliac joints. Um, so that's another um, uh, symptom as well. And sometimes patients have recurrent chest pains um, that get worse with deep breaths and that can be associated with lupus and other autoimmune diseases as well. Um, in the field of rheumatology, of course, you're talking about like GI, like inflammatory bowel disease, like um, Crohn's disease, and also colitis. You have recurrent diarrhea. You can have um, recurrent uh, bloody bowel movements. So those are just some examples. And multiple sclerosis is a big one, where patients, you know, they sometimes lose control of their arms and legs, uh, where they don't get numbness and tingling down those extremities. They can't think clearly. So I mean. There's so many symptoms and that's why it's so hard to get diagnosed sometimes because unless you're in that field, sometimes you don't think about those diseases. Yeah, for sure. And these different symptoms, at the very least, they can be very uncomfortable and chronic and consistent, but at the worst, it can be completely debilitating for somebody, especially if they're not sure what's going on with them. It can be very confusing. It can even affect their mental health because as you said, you went to so many different doctors before you actually got a diagnosis. And I feel like that happens a lot. So, so tell me about when it comes to the diagnosis of these conditions, is it a definite yes or no, or can the diagnosis be more elusive and murky? And on average, how long does it take to get diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder? Uh, also a great question. So some autoimmune diseases, oh, well, let's talk about rheumatology. When patients come to me for rheumatology, um, sometimes I don't even need labs. Based on the symptoms, I know right away what they have, okay? For like rheumatoid arthritis, they have the right distribution of the joint pain. They tell me that's more stiffness. They tell me they um, get better with movement. I'm like, this is rheumatoid arthritis. I'm gonna get, get labs on you um, to get to diagnose you. Uh, but sometimes it can be very, very tricky. Um, the diagnosis can be very gray, and you can see multiple doctors, and you have multiple opinions of what you have. So some patients, you run the labs on them. The labs will show a little rheumatoid arthritis, a little bit of other um, symptoms. I mean, other diseases, but the symptoms don't match up with those diseases. And then you then you have like three different diagnoses from three different doctors. So it can be very confusing. And sometimes 
you have the symptoms that sort of match like rheumatology, but you actually have a disease of another system. Or, or you don't even have an autoimmune disease. You have like something like Ehlers Danlos, which can mimic some of our diseases, uh, which is a hypermobility um, disease. And s- there are new diagnoses coming up now, like mass activation syndrome, which can mimic um, other diseases um, of autoimmune disease, which, which is not an autoimmune disease, mass activation syndrome. It's a new diagnosis in the past 10 years, which I'm seeing in my clinic now because I expanded my clinic beyond rheumatology. Um, but it can be very confusing. Um, and you know, you I see patients in the ICU as a presenting, um, where that's the first time they present to me, and these patients are very sick, and sometimes it can be even confusing what they have as well, even though they're in the ICU already. Yeah, so that can be just so frustrating for a patient, and also for the doctors, knowing that there can be so much overlap of symptoms. And then we have new diagnoses that we're discovering all the time about, you know, the body is so complex and so many different things can go wrong. Is there an estimate on how long it might take to reach a diagnosis? Mm, Oh man, you know, it can take a while. It can take six months. It can take a year. It can take a couple of years. You know, I, I mean, I've seen patients who have been living with their, disease for like 20 years um and no one's really diagnosed them until they saw me because their primary care doctor never thought about it never referred out so the patient doesn't think about it um you know average wait times for rheumatology are like six months to a year in some places so you can imagine you send primary care doctor sends a patient to rheumatology and you can't get seen in six months to a year i mean and then your doctor sees you for the first time in six months, gets labs on you, they don't know what you have, it takes another three, six months to get diagnosed. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I hear over and over again is it just takes a long time sometimes. What is the underlying cause of autoimmune disease? Why do these even happen? Yeah, so the underlying cause of autoimmune disease can be very tricky and complicated. And it goes beyond lifestyle medicine. A um, couple years ago, when we first talked, I only knew much, only knew about lifestyle medicine. Now that I have this big tool in my toolbox, I understand it so much better. But I will tell you, our understanding of autoimmune disease is in its infancy. We know a lot, but we also don't know everything. Okay, and that, as you remember from medical school, your 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 teachers probably told you that half of what you learn in medical school is wrong; the other half is right. And I still apply it to what I know today. Um, so autoimmune disease, the cause of autoimmune disease, number one is lifestyle. Okay, that's the foundation. So poor diet is a contributor. High stress, high chronic stress is a contributor. Childhood trauma is a contributor. Poor sleep, lack of exercise, these are all contributors. And sometimes you can just change your diet like I did. And your disease goes away. Um, that's the best case scenario. Eat the right diet, eat a lot of veggies, lots of fruits, high fiber, high fiber nutrients, you get better. You get rid of stress, that can help as well. But I see patients in my clinic, they do all that. They go whole food plant-based, they do other diets. It doesn't help. It helps a little bit, but it doesn't go all the way. Or I see patients that are recurrent medications. I mean, they go on different medications, they do the lifestyle part, and they're still flaring, they're so resistant. Why is that? What are the other root causes of autoimmune disease? Um, the LB, environmental toxins. We have so many toxins in our environment now. Pollution, there are studies on pollution contributing as a risk factor to autoimmune disease. Smoking is another risk factor. Other risk factors are pesticides. Studies on lupus and rheumatoid arthritis show that when you have exposure to these, that you will have higher risk of these autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis. You have direct exposure that's even a higher risk. You have plastics, BPA, BPS. These can be, like, be a possible contributor to autoimmune disease. PFAS, uh, VOCs, all these different things in your water sources, in your candles, in your um, in, in different things at home can contribute to autoimmune disease. It might give not give it to you the next day, but uh, might contribute to the long run. We know these are endocrine disruptors. There are papers on these in Nature Review, even on calling them immune dysregulators as well. Other things are infections, 
mycoplasma, Lyme disease, Bartonella, um, mold. These are things in the integrative world that um, it's very niched, but I'm learning more about that I'm treating in my clinic and um, it can help patients. So in lifestyle, it, it's beyond lifestyle sometimes. It, it takes such a deep understanding, lots of learning beyond medical school, beyond conventional medicine to really help these patients and to potentially fix it once and for all. I'm just so grateful that you're learning about all these things. And you're right. I mean, it's so difficult because we go to medical school, we learn a certain set of, you know, evidence and knowledge, and then we go out and we just practice that same way. But sometimes we stay stagnant if we don't continue to learn. And I think also in the medical culture, sometimes it's almost like other physicians are looked down upon if they're seeking out other ways to help their patients because things may seem fringy and all of that. But I'm just gonna say when it comes to autoimmune disease, it's necessary because these conditions are so complicated, they're so multifactorial that we just have to think about all the different potential causes to these complicated conditions that can be triggered. So I'm really glad you're learning about that. I just recently had a guest who, he's an herbologist, he's also a physician by training, and he got into herbs and he talked about the stealth microbiome and it just made a lot of sense and how we're exposed to all these different germs back you know bacteria viruses everything that you know most of the time we fight off and it's fine but sometimes they stay within us and they can reactivate and, and trigger some of these conditions so it's really important to know about that so given all of that how are people typically treated for autoimmune disorders in the usa what is, is let's start with just rheumatology because that's your field what are rheumatologists usually using to help people get better yeah so when you go to your rheumatologist office um they'll present you with different options for treatment uh, well even oh well, you'll be lucky if they present you options actually um but they'll give you medications that uh modulate the immune system so they'll give you methotrexate they'll give you lafunamide sulfasalazine some those are some of the weaker meds but you can graduate quickly to biologics which are usually injectable medications these are medications that some people say will suppress the immune system I try not to say that because when you have autoimmune disease, your immune system is on overdrive. It's hyperactive. So what we're doing is trying to bring that immune system back down to earth. Um, so these biologics, so you need these certain immune pathways to fight infections and viruses. So we're shutting off part of these pathways to fight your autoimmune disease. So in turn, you you have higher risk of cancer. You have higher risk of infections. You have to take longer time to recover from like the flu. Um, you might have higher chance of having these allergic reactions from these sh shots and medications. So um, those that's how you're typically treated in America. Mm -hmm. And what is your approach to treating autoimmune disease? What do you do differently in your office? Yeah, so I still give these medications. I still offer them in my toolbox. But some of my patients don't ever want to go near these meds. So that's why I'm going down a rabbit hole to learn what their options there are. So usually I give different options to patients. I'm like, look, you have option A where you can take medications, but I go through a thorough review and education on lifestyle medicine and diet in my clinic. And I couple that with medications. And if they don't want medications, fine. But I also give supplements. I, um, help with detoxification, scientific way of detoxification. I try to remove environmental toxins. And there are other things I do in my clinic um, that alternative medicine stuff, herbs that can potentially help patients. Um, and sometimes I combine everything together. Some patients are okay with some meds and they want the other half as well. I'm like, oh, that's good. So we can start on meds. If you're, um, in, if especially in your severe case, I start meds right away and I don't wait and I work backwards. So usually I, my goal is if I put on meds to take them off eventually. So I have seen in yeah. my clinic, some yeah. patients never need to go on medications. Um, they go, to, they can go to remission just with diet and other factors. Mm -hmm. Some people may just have such severe symptoms that helping them get some relief may 
lend them that opportunity to start working on some of the other lifestyle habits and behaviors that they can implement. How often do you feel like your patients are excited to or willing to actually make changes in their nutrition and their lifestyle habits? I would say 90% are because <laughs> I think I'm known for this um, on social media and on Google. If you type in this, if you Google me, like if you type in integrated rheumatologist or lifestyle medicine rheumatologist, I'm in the first two uh, um, search options actually. Uh, so um, patients are ready or already have made changes by the time they come to my clinic. Um, the only people that are not willing to are the ones that you know don't know who I am and come to my clinic <laughs> not expecting this. Um, but most people um, have done so much by the time they come to my clinic or are ready to make changes. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I think there's a lot of motivation behind um, making changes for this. Have you seen some pretty amazing transformations or recoveries in people that have been able to implement some of these diet and lifestyle changes? Mm -hmm. I have, I have. I mean, I'm an example. Um, I think patients are inspired. Um, the fact that I got better without supplements, without meds, and just uh, diet changes. Um, there are patients I have who have been told that by the other rheumatologists um, that you need to go on biologics now. Um, I remember, I've, I've, I have a couple of cases I can give you. So I have a case, um, patient got diagnosed with non-radiographic axial spondylarthritis, which is ankylosing spondylitis without the x-ray and MRI changes. The patient was told to go on Humira um, by her rheumatologist. She came to see me. I said, listen, just try to go on a plant-based diet or try to eat a lot of plants at least. And within one visit, she said all her pain's gone. Um, she can run. She can play baseball. Um, and she was still eating some meat, but she was eating a lot more plants, got rid of all the processed food. I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> and I've seen her like multiple visits now. It's been over a year and she's still doing very, very well. And she was suffering for so long. Um, so that's one amazing case. Another one um, is another patient who was told to go on methotrexate um, with, for her rheumatoid arthritis. She wasn't doing so hot when she came to see me. I, I tried so many things on her. So we've tried the fasting already, which we're going to talk about. Um, that sort of helped her. Uh, and then we, I added um, like some integrative modalities like red light therapy. I added, um, uh, she did plant-based diet as well. So I added all these little things. I added supplements. And then all these things um, together helped her to get better to the point where she can run like a couple miles now without pain. Um, I did have to add a little bit of medication, but Plaquenil very weak, um, but she got better w with all these things together. So I didn't have to use strong medications. Um, and there are other patients who, like I had a 12 year old kid in my clinic um, the other month who I use an integrative medic medication on. And she, this kid was on heavy duty biologics before. And within one visit, he said it was 100% better, which kind of shocked me. I didn't expect that, but that coupled with lifestyle changes, um, helped my patients. Wow, that's so amazing and incredible. And, you know, just to think about it, you know, you've experienced this too, whenever you're struggling with some of these conditions for years and years and years, frustrated, can't find any relief, being able to find that combination of treatments that helps you. I mean, I'm sure the patients are just so happy and, you know, just so grateful and thankful that you were able to help them. All right, well, let's switch gears and get into fasting. So talk to me about how fasting can be utilized for the treatment of autoimmune disease. And maybe we can talk about some of the studies or any research that has been done pointing to benefits specifically for autoimmune conditions. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, great question. So with autoimmune disease, fasting can definitely help. Um, fasting, there are different ways to fast. You can do multi-day fast some people do five day fasting three day water fast um i put them i probably wouldn't recommend such a long fast if you're doing it for the first time there are fasting centers out there especially the ones in northern california i live in california so I, i'm more familiar with this area so northern california there are different fasting centers where you can actually be monitored to make sure you don't faint or anything like that Just make sure it's not too dangerous um, you can do a 24 hour water fast, which I think is relatively safe. You can do a 16, eight water fast, 16 on, eight off. 
I mean, 16 off, 8 on. Or I tell my patients, you can do a simple 12-hour water fast, which is pretty simple. ES, latest meal, 7 p.m., first meal, 7 a.m. That's a fast as well. So when I flare, I usually feel like for the day, I would just do a 24-hour water fast within a day as you get a lot better, go back to remission again. Um, so fasting can really help. It can help with a lot of different autoimmune diseases. Um, I tell my patients all the time, you should water or do some kind of water fast at least 12 hours off so don't eat in the middle of the night because it still does just throws off your circadian rhythm um and it can trigger inflammation even more if you eat too late especially if you eat the wrong foods yes and then how about research that's been done yeah so there are a couple studies even dating back to the 80s and 90s on fasting so there was a even in the rheumatology journals they talked about this way back then um i think there was seminars um of rheumatology seminars of arthritis um there was a study in the 1990s um the author was kajelson and Kral. i can't pronounce his name i always bring up this study but never was able to pronounce his name but um it was a single blind uh, control trial randomized control trial and there were 53 patients in the study um, half the group, they all had rheumatoid arthritis. Half the group was assigned to fasting followed by a vegetarian diet. The other group was assigned to just a regular um, diet, didn't really change too much. And the, they, um, the group that fasted, they fasted for seven to 10 days. And then it was followed by a vegetarian diet and they already felt an effect on the fasting for seven to 10 days. And after the veggie diet for, for three and a half months, they followed for another year and they found that the pain went down the pain scale went down, the inflammation went down, ESR, CRP, lab values went down, their swelling went down as well. And um, this is just one example of rheumatoid arthritis um, that was improved by fasting followed by a vegetarian diet. Uh, another one was um, Mueller in 2001, and he found that fasting also followed by a vegetarian diet improved his arthritis patients as well. And um, a recent study was by Adawi in 2019. Um, this is a study I brought up during my grand rounds as well. It was a study on Ramadan fasting on psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. So Ramadan, um, for a whole month, you can't eat at a certain time. I think from dusk till dawn, um, you can't eat. So they found that the psoriasis and the psoriatic arthritis both improved um, in the patients that did Ramadan fasting. So those are some examples of how fasting has helped patients um, and the research you know there's basic science research behind this too and even new england journal of medicine has talked about um, the fasting mimicking diet so um, how does fasting from a basic science level help with autoimmune disease so there's a pathway with mTOR which i'm sure has been talked about multiple times on this podcast since you're doing a, a series on um, autoimmune not autoimmune but a series on fasting so when you eat, it kicks up something called mTOR, okay? And mTOR, it, you need mTOR to build up cells. We need mTOR, okay? But when you have too much mTOR going on, there can be inflammation um, being driven. So when you increase mTOR, it will increase Th1 and Th17 T cells. Th1 and Th17 C cells are really necessary in our body. We need them, okay? We but when there are overdrive, when there's too much of it, it can drive inflammation, especially if it's autoimmune disease, it will spark even more autoimmune disease flares. And um, when you block mTOR, and you can do that by fasting, it can in actually increase T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells are a subset of your T cells that are important for driving against inflammation. You need T regulatory cells in the body. Naturally, you need it to um, help you. So let's say example, what is the function of T regulatory cells? Let's explain that first. So T regulatory cells are used when you, for example, have a bacterial infection or flu and your body is fighting this with inflammation. Your T regulatory cells are used to shut that off, to tell your body, we're done fighting the infection. We don't need to fight it anymore. That's what T regulatory cells normally do. But um, I, but in your body, your T regulatory cells are also important for autoimmune disease because it tells your body that this is part of my body. We don't need to fight this cell. We can ignore it. We don't want to fight it. Um, 
So T reactor cells, cells are actually depleted in a lot of different autoimmune disease, which makes sense because it's, it's supposed to tell your body that you're not supposed to fight itself, and now you're fighting itself. And um, by blocking mTOR, um, you can increase T reactor cells. And also, um, by fasting, you can increase beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, I don't know, Dr. Yami, if you remember from medical school, from residency, when you have patients with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, you always check beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, so, in, in general medicine, you can look up the study back like three years ago. There's a nice diagram on there showing how beta hydroxybutyrate actually goes up um, with ketogenic diets and with fasting. And that can, um, with a beta hydroxybutyrate, it can um, be part of that biochemical pathway to help with. Um, inflammation. That's incredible. And what I think in my mind is that whenever we are having these periods of fasting, even if it's like a shorter intermittent fast of 12 hours overnight, we're allowing our body to come into balance. And when you're talking about mTOR, a lot of these, you know, different proteins and enzymes in our body, it's about balance. You don't want too much, you don't want too little, so it gives your body that time to balance, to clean up, to with the T regulatory cells, make sure everything is labeled properly, you know, you're going in and organizing everything. This is, you know, our our own cells, this is not our own cells, you know. And so you're just giving your body time and space to do those things. But when we're constantly eating, especially with the standard American diet, people are eating late at night, they're having their midnight snack, they're getting very little sleep, getting up early, and then starting in on the donuts right away. So you're not allowing your body that time to reach the balance with, you know, all of these different things in your body. So I wanted to kind of make an analogy there that might be easier for some people to remember, but I really appreciate you explaining the basic science because I think that helps people realize that this is legit. There are some things that really are happening inside your body that have been studied and seem to have a benefit when it comes to these uh, conditions. So what is your experience using fasting as part of the treatment regimen? It sounds like you use it yourself. How often do you need to discuss it with your patients? Do you advise most patients have at least 12 hours, you know, circadian fasting? What kind, what kind of approach do you have with fasting? Yeah, so um, with fasting, I would say minimum 12 hours um, for my patients. Some patients, I don't tell them to fast because their BMI is way too low, they're undernourished, so that's not a time mm. to fast. So um, most of my patients, I do tell them to at least do a 12 hour on, 12 hour off. Um, I tell them if you're flaring, you can do a 24 hour water fast. Beyond that, just be careful. You just need to be have experience with it. Um, so that's how I tell my patients. I tell my patients, you know, I, I fast myself. I try to fast like one time a month. I, I should do it more. Um, there's anti-aging properties, there's autophagy when you fast. Um, so beyond what I just talked about with the mTOR, um, autophagy is another benefit of fasting. It can clean up a lot of, um, uh, I would say called bad cells or um, cells, a lot of debris in the body, which can cause inflammation. So that's another benefit of fasting as well. So fasting, it's part of my treatment protocol. It's not my only tool, um, but I tell patients if you're flaring, then you have the green light to definitely fast. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, obviously, if someone has, you know, they're malnourished, you know, fasting is not going to be for them because they need to make sure that they're getting plenty of calories in. That makes sense. Of course, we know that pregnant women and children, we don't advise any extended fasting as well. But is there any cases where fasting may be detrimental to the condition or have you ever seen it cause a flare for somebody? I haven't seen it cause a flare for somebody, um, but for some patients, you know, they have eating disorders, then I don't, like, they tell me they don't want to do fasting. I tell them that, well, that's probably not a good idea either. Um, so, I mean, eating disorders, patients, if they're, if they're not comfortable, they shouldn't fast because they can exacerbate the eating disorder. Um, there, there can be some mental stress when it comes to, you know, diet and fasting. So, but as far as flares and autoimmune disease, I have not seen it make an autoimmune disease worse when patients flare. I just hear good things about it. 
Okay, so I guess you've kind of addressed this a little bit, but can you take us through how a patient may start fasting and how long it might take to experience benefits of the fasting regimen? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, th I mentioned earlier that I tell patients 12 hours on, 12 hours off at a minimum. Um, but I tell them if you want to see more effect that you might want to do like eat, how when you have a window of eight hours of eating or six hours of eating. Um, but if you're flaring, like I said, at least 24 hours of fasting is recommended. Um, as far as an effect, me personally, I see an effect within like the same day. Um, other patients might see an effect the next couple of days. Uh, but you should see an effect like within a day or so of fasting. Yeah, it's gonna, it can be pretty incredible. I mean, I can attest to that for myself. Okay, well, this has been super great. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell me about your own way of eating. And you've already talked about integrating fasting, but do you do any daily intermittent fasting as well as you know your occasional 24-hour fasts? Yeah, I mean, I try to. <laughs> I'm not the best at it, especially when I'm stressed. I tend to stress eat, which is not good, uh, which then causes flares. <laughs> um, especially like when you're when you're reading and then you get bored and then you go to the fridge. I mean, I have a habit of just going to the fridge, looking at it and closing it, not getting anything. Um, but I mean, I try to fast at least 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, and then if, especially if I'm flaring, then I definitely do a 24 hour water fast. Um, but I try to mentally tell myself, you know what, let's eat by 8 PM, 7 PM and that's it. And then start again. Um, the next day is you just skip breakfast. Um, sometimes, you know, I skip breakfast and I skip lunch cause I go to work. I'm not hungry anymore. And that's a natural fast. So I actually eat like six hours, eight hours a day naturally. So like a couple times a week, I would say I actually do a fast. Um, without even thinking about it now that now that you bring it up yeah it's just kind of the way that you work with your uh your, your busy lifestyle how about your way of eating tell us what your usual food intake is like during the day what kind of things are you focusing on for your for your food yeah so um for breakfast if i do eat breakfast it'll be oatmeal um uh, if i'm gonna go it'll be like a bar um without any ads and like a lara bar or something or i try to go for organic stuff but usually lara bar um is what i have um or oatmeal or a smoothie um what else is there for lunch um it'll be something plant-based on there so um there are restaurants near me at work that you know sometimes i'll get um that have like whole grains with some veggies in it beans like a buddha bowl um or we have leftovers mm -hmm. uh, at home that i'll bring to work um sometimes for snacks you know there are really good snacks out there not all snacks are bad um i know there is what's that? there's a couple of brands out there i think ryan is a good brand there's some brands that you know are packaged yes they're packaged but there's no ads and there's like just dry carrots with some salt in it there's some dry broccoli in there there there's good snacks so i eat those things um i, I bring a smoothie to work sometimes uh, for dinner uh, and it's usually my wife that cooks because she has her cooking show now on youtube um and she's a better cook in this house so she'll make like something with tofu beans um something whole food plant based as much as we can i mean we still we use oil sometimes we eat out um it's not always sometimes it's very processed but i mean we tr we do the best we can i always tell my patients 80 percent 80 20 rule 80 percent of the time you do the best you can 20 percent of the time it's life i mean i can't eat whole food plant based all the time um i have my asian culture you know sometimes my family there'll be some seafood on there i mean i try not to eat it but sometimes it's on there i'll eat a little bit of fish but that's i mean that's the extent that i'll go but most of the time at home we're pretty much whole food plant based with minimal oil yeah, it sounds delicious. And how lucky you are that Melissa is cooking for you. I'm going to come over and visit and eat some of that food too. I'm sure it's so yummy. Okay, so we're going to finish off with the fasting rapid fire questions. But before we get to that, I would love for you to remind us where my listeners can reach you, what products and services you offer. And if someone's interested in working with you, as a rheumatologist, as a physician for your medical practice, how can they work with you? Yeah. Um, so if you want to find me in my clinic, um, the website is 
Dr. Lifestyle. That's Dr. Lifestyle is a clinic name. And then um, the website is drlifestyle.org.org. So that's drlifestyle.org. Um, and if you want to find me on social media, it is um, my Autonomy MD is the handle. I'm on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, I'm everywhere. My website is myautoimmunemd.com. That's my personal website. You can sign up with my newsletter. Um, in our clinic at Dr. Lifestyle, it's me and my wife, Dr. Melissa uh, Mandala, and we do both integrative functional medicine and lifestyle medicine. We combine all our tools in the toolbox for our patients um, with the option of conventional medicine as well. So she does integrative psychiatry and primary care. I do um, mainly rheumatology and complex chronic illnesses like mold and other things like that. Um, and different autoimmune diseases and mast cell too. So that's how you can find us. Um, so just go on Google, you can find us so easily. If you type in integrative rheumatologist, uh, lifestyle medicine rheumatologist, I'm one of the, I'm on the first page, you can find me there as well. And I'm, I'm location wise. That's so I'm amazing, Southern that's Cal great. Yeah, and I'm in Southern California in Newport Beach, if you wanna see me physically. Mm -hmm. But you're licensed in how many states now? I know that the list is very long. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I forgot to mention that I'm actually licensed in 15 states in the USA. Um, so you can see all those states on the website. And I do a lot of telemedicine. So some of my patients, I would say 40% of my patients are outside of California. They've never seen me in person. Um, and I'm their main rheumatologist as well. So they're, I'm very flexible in how I work with patients. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, are you ready for the fasting rapid fire? Let's do it. Okay, what's your favorite thing about fasting? Um, that I can bring down inflammation. What's your biggest fasting pet peeve? It might be a myth, a misconception, or a misuse of fasting. Um, that my biggest pet peeve is that it can people think I can cure everything, which it can't, and people think it cures for everybody. Where there's a good population it's good for, but there's a subset that probably shouldn't do fasting. Um, so um, that's my biggest pet peeve is that if, everyone, if people think that they can get cured by fasting, I, I would say that you can improve a lot. You can actually go to remission for a period of time, but what you eat afterwards is very important, what you do after fasting as well. Yes, yes, sir, I agree with that. Okay, what's the one thing you want people to understand about fasting? Um, fasting um, is a great tool in the toolbox. We've been doing it since the beginning of time. Um, um, a lot of religions do fasting and there's a reason why behind that. Um, it's not, and there's science behind it. So fasting can be a very powerful tool and I think everyone should incorporate some form of fast in their daily life. I love it. Dr. Micah Yu, thank you so much. This has been so helpful and fantastic. I know my listeners are going to love it. And I hope for those that are struggling and need more help, they reach out to you so that you can give them the love and care that you give to your patients. I appreciate you so much. I'm grateful for everything that you're doing. And I hope that you have a very fantastic day. Thank you so much. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.